Hello, and welcome back to our Philosophy and Ethics podcast series. Last time we talked about the question of pain. And what that question is, is complicated. Often we think the question should be, what do we do when we see someone else in pain? From a philosophical perspective, though, before we can answer what do we do, we have to ask, do we know? How do we know if someone's in pain, and what does knowing someone's in pain even mean? In the course that I described last time, where we walk through the philosophy and science of pain, we start with René Descartes, the French philosopher. Descartes, if you know anything about him, you know, I think, therefore I am. We call this rationalism on the one hand. It means that uh, the basis of knowledge is in your own ability to think. We also call it solipsism. These are two different components of his thinking. Uh, We also call it solipsism, which um, comes from solely as in alone and so it means to to think alone the only thing that you can know is yourself and so his phrase i think therefore i am is a declaration of rationalist solipsism i only know that i am thinking as with most people in the 17th century uh, descartes was a biologist and a philosopher and an everything else In his book, The Passions of the Soul, Descartes is trying to think about the relationship between the mind and the body, and he has what we call a very mechanistic sense of how the body works. It's a series of fibers that are pulled by outside stimuli. These cause animal spirits, so so sort of like liquids, to flow through the body, um, and they come through pores in the head, and they wash across the pineal gland, which he said was the seat of the soul. And that movement across the pineal gland is the translation of these mechanistic bodily feelings to our more complex soul. Now, obviously, this is not modern science. (laughs) Um, But what it means is that there's a very mechanistic correlation between your body on the outside, and then um, as those stimuli wash across your pineal gland, if you are a strong-souled person, you can control your response. If you're a weak-souled person, that movement's just going to drive you to... um, sort of impulsive responses. Descartes had um, a longtime friendship question mark. I feel like they really liked each other based on their rhetoric, but I can't publish that anywhere. Um, A longtime friendship with Elizabeth of Bohemia. um, And in an exchange of letters with her, she said, okay, but if soul and body are of different substance, like this doesn't really explain how they can actually affect each other. And also what about like when simply feeling or thinking about something like makes you feel more? That doesn't come from an outside stimulus, that's a sort of internal stimulus. Descartes never really solves this problem, they go back and forth a little bit. She kind of wins, he adjusts some things, but never really, really solves it. Where Descartes leaves us, though, and the reason we start with Descartes, is that I think if we ask most people, we know what we're feeling, but we're not always sure that we know what everyone else is feeling. We have this kind of skepticism that we inherited from Descartes about other people's feelings and about our knowledge about other people's feelings. Elaine Scarry, who is a a 20th, 21st century philosopher, says that to say I am in pain is to have certainty, and to hear someone else say I am in pain is to have doubt. We know our own feelings, but we are inherently skeptical that we can know what other people are feeling. I think this is why philosophy is important. Now, obviously, like I have a vested stake in convincing people that philosophy is important, but I think it's important because we do all have, I think, different natural inclinations, something that's often overlooked in the conversation about empathy, the academic conversation. And knowing all of that is, I think, the counter argument to something I often even feel when I'm doing my work, which is like, who who cares about why, right? Because you said it, it matters. Um, for some people, someone somewhere in conflict theory knows the thinking behind this, but like, does it does it matter if they do? If they can execute it properly, then who cares if they know it? But I think the counter argument to that is like, if you know all of the different philosophies or approaches to this, then you can recognize your tendency and remember the other ones, right? Like if, if I know that I'm easily overcome by other people's feelings, it might be useful for me to be like, I'm thinking about conflict resolution, I feel all of this conflict. This is not my conflict. I'm going to smith myself through this for a moment, or I'm going to recur myself through this. What I talk about in in my book is like, if you're right 99% of the time, the one time you walk in and you feel the vibe that your patient is, let's go with like the worst case, like that your patient is super happy and doing well, and you respond with that happiness and you think you're marrying them, but you're wrong. 
like that's some some harm that you've done to that patient because you have assumed that you know their feelings even though i know myself as somebody who is sort of resonant with other people i never believe what i'm feeling because if i'm right 99 percent of the time i don't i don't want to sacrifice that one person's feelings for the time that i think i'm right mm -hmm. and and the other option would be you walk into a patient's room and you're a very smithian sort of person and you say well if i were in this scenario I would feel, you know, a level six pain and I would want, I wouldn't mind if the doctor did this, but this particular person might be feeling deep, deep pain or, or no pain. Right. And if you simply put yourself in their shoes, you forget that like, maybe you never can fit those shoes. Maybe they don't even wear shoes. Maybe they have flippers and it's important for you to kind of, um, make space for them to share that with you.